the way we have babies has changed so much over the past, I would say, five to 10 years. The sperm lives in the female reproductive tract for up to five days. So fertility is a disease, but if you can remove some of the stress from the process, let's do that. Hello everyone, welcome back to Nadia's Lab. Dr. Jamie, you are one of the one of the amazing people's, uh, people I met and you are a fertility specialist and you are one of the best fertility specialists in the world, which is why oh, I chose nice. you uh, to start my fertility journey. Uh, we are here in CCRM Clinic in New York and I just want to say thank you for joining me today and agreeing to um, do this podcast with me. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. So I just wanted to start, if, if it's okay for you to tell me a little bit more about yourself, what is it that you do in this mm -hmm. clinic, and uh, what your role kind of involves. Sure. So um, you sort of, you said it before, my name is Jamie Notman. I'm a fertility doctor. I joke around in saying I used to call myself an infertility doctor, and now I call myself a fertility doctor because the way we have babies has changed so much over the past, I would say, five to 10 years. Uh, so I spent a lot of time getting here, a lot of school. I did a residency in OBGYN, learning oh, wow. how to do obstetrics, deliver babies. And then I subspecialized for three extra years in infertility. Okay. Um, and pretty much I spend most of my days now helping women and couples preserve their fertility even more than treat their infertility. So that was a shift that we saw really about, I'd say, seven to ten years ago. Um, but it's it's a pretty awesome job, actually. Yes, <laughs> I, I can imagine. So um, there is this common belief, um, including myself and I know other people, that as soon as you see a fertility specialist like yourself, that next step is kind of IVF. Mm -hmm. But I believe there is so much more to it. And what I learned today as well, having this consultation with yourself, with my partner, there's a lot of tests and advice that you can give to couples who are trying to conceive. Yeah, so yes, IVF is sort of what we're best known for, right? But not every couple or any, every individual needs IVF. So there's we tailor our treatment regimen to what the needs of the individual or the couple are. And based on testing results, patient desires, right? Like I said to you, how many kids do you want? If somebody wants four or five kids, my recommendations are going to be different than if somebody wants one. So my job is to really read the room yeah. and see what the individual or the couple needs and help best guide them there. Amazing. And um, I wanted to say, so yeah, we talked about your approach with couples and um, initial consultations. So getting to know them, getting their medica medication history and what their de desires are. Mm -hmm. And when would you say is the ideal time for couples to approach you? Do you think that there's a specific time like after six months or a year of trying to conceive? Or would you say meeting meeting you and having this appointment and patient initial consultation sooner than later is better because yeah. then they they just you know get more like advice and they get the knowledge and they get educated and they know if something's wrong earlier? I think sooner rather than later. I've always been, I, I'm struck by, so when you, you know, go to see an OBGYN, he or she does a pap smear, a breast exam, talks about contraception, but we really need to start talking about fertility at those appointments, right? It should be on your checklist as an OBGYN. And what do you want to do about children, right? Yeah. And it doesn't mean that somebody has to feel stressed or has to be oh my God, I have to go and have a baby. It more means, is there something in your medical, your family, your gynecologic history that may make fertility more challenging? And so maybe you should see a fertility doctor at a younger age. In 2023, the ASRM changed the definition of infertility. So okay. it used to be that you had to try for one year if you were under the age of 35 and six months if you were above the age of 35. Okay. But the big gray gap was what if you were single, a single woman and you didn't have sperm? Or what if you were a same-sex couple and you didn't have the opposite gamete? You were really removed from the conversation and therefore your insurance would not cover it because they said you're not infertile. Yeah. So the ASRM very astutely said, we have to do something. So in 2023, they said, 
you can be infertile just based on your social or situation. So if you are a male, male couple, of course you're infertile. How are you going to have a baby? And that really opened it up. So more people came in to see us and more people had access to the benefits that were available to them. Amazing. And you mentioned this, that the the guidelines and the rule has changed. Mm -hmm. Um, What do you think is... um, causing this rise in infertility? Well, I think the way, I'm like, this is chapter three of our book, but I think the way we have children has changed so dramatically, right? I'm obviously, I'm older than you, but my 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 parents' generation had their kids in their early 20s. It was mm. just what people did. They got married at 20, they had babies at 22, and that was, that was how it was. Yeah. Now, people don't get married at the same, the average age of marriage has risen. The yeah. average age of first birth in this country is 30, right? Think about that. And across the world, in some countries like South Korea or Japan, it's even 32. Yeah. The number of children we have has decreased. So, and women are now more than 50% of law school and medical school. And so women are professionally kicking butt, but it has impacted our fertility. So I think all of that combined has led to increasing numbers of infertility uh, cases. Absolutely. And um, in terms of um, recommendations and advice for couples, so for example, I've asked you this during our consultation and you mentioned, is it more important to have, you know, um, unprotected sexual intercourse during your ovulation or we shouldn't be really focusing on tracking ovulation and just have regular unprotected sexual intercourse in order to increase the chances to conceive? I'm sort of a minimalist in terms of, Um, sort of like bells and whistles when you're trying. I think when you start trying, have unprotected intercourse. Try and have regular unprotected intercourse. But I don't think you need to jump to the ovulation prediction kits unless you have a partner who's always traveling Mm. or, you know, you are not in the same place at the same time or whatever it may be. But I'm sort of of the, I'm a fan of take the stress out of it initially until you actually need to be like, wow, there is a problem because there's not one minute that you can get pregnant. The sperm lives in the female reproductive tract for up to five days. So if you ovulated on day 14, but you had intercourse on day 11, you are protected, right? There is sperm there. Yeah. Yes, the highest rate of pregnancy, of achieving a pregnancy is having intercourse the day before you ovulate. Okay. But the sperm will survive. So if you have unprotected intercourse at a regular cadence, you should be okay. Okay, fine. And you mentioned stress, uh, stressing about ovulation, like I also try and track it. Uh, and do you think that stress can negatively impact um, or there are not really any studies to prove this? Well, I'm they? the daughter okay. of a psychologist, so I'm always saying stress impacts every aspect okay. of our lives, right? Sure. If you think about like it impacts your sleep. We think that patients who have cancer and enroll in support groups do better than those that don't. So clearly stress impacts our life, but the degree to which it impacts our fertility, we don't, we don't know. know. And what I think about, I've said this a lot, like women, we blame ourselves for everything, right? There's yeah. guilt, there's shame. So then we say, oh, now it's my fault again because I'm stressed and that's why I'm infertile. And like your mother-in-law is like, oh, go take a trip and you'll get pregnant. That is so ridiculous, right? Infertility is a disease and we all know that. But, but if you can remove some of the stress from the process, let's do that. Okay, perfect. And are there any other overlooked factors that can interfere with fertility? Well, I think... The biggest thing I always say, and it's if you, you know, my kids are sort of sick of me saying this because they have a mom who's a gynecologist, like we really should talk to our female relatives because we tend to mimic our moms, our sisters, our aunts a lot, right? So there used to be like shame, like we didn't talk about menopause, right? We didn't talk about miscarriage, but we should because if you had a mom who went through menopause at 40, that is very important for your fertility, right? Or if you had an aunt who had six miscarriages, that may be very important for your fertility. So I think we have to sort of like remove the shame, the blame, the guilt, and be much more open about our journeys because it helps other people. Other people, yeah. Amazing. I agree with that. And um, some other myths about fertility, Mm myth-busting. I mean, this is more about during pregnancy, but I don't know what you think about caffeine dangerous during pregnancy. I mean, clearly I'm a caffeine addict. If you know, anyone like who knows me, like it's crazy. But 
you can drink coffee during pregnancy. You can drink coffee when you're trying to get pregnant. Should you drink six cups of Starbucks a day? No. Okay. But that's life. Like, life really probably should be lived in moderation. Even food, right? Patients will say, do I have to stop eating gluten, dairy, and mm. alcohol? And I'm say, no, right? Because that then what life are you living right so yeah. of course if you have celiac disease which is a gluten sense you're not going to have gluten no, yeah but if you're trying to conceive you may cut down on things that are not healthy but cutting it out completely is not what i would no, recommend absolutely and any other supplements that you would recommend for someone who's trying to get pregnant to take i tell patients to take a prenatal vitamin because okay. that is what you should take a reproductive age woman trying to conceive but that's really it today there are there's data about acai, CoQ10, right? Myonositol. And patients ask me all the time. And I say it none of those will hurt, mm-hmm. but we just don't know if they're gonna help. So if you are somebody who wants to do that, if you wanna go some of the eastern path, you wanna do the acupuncture, you wanna do great. Mm-hmm. But there we can't say that it, it it's a must because we just don't know yet. Yeah. And um just going back, you mentioned Um, Having um, regular sexual intercourse is more important than necessarily um, being obsessed with tracking uh, ovulation. What would you say, by definition, is um, regular sexual intercourse? I would say having intercourse, you know, one to two times a week should keep you covered. Okay, perfect. Um, And then are there any interesting stories um, or something you'd like to share? Maybe your work with Gamito or any other innovation in fertility space that really excites you or something that's, you know, new and innovative? Yeah. I mean, clearly we both have a passion and think Gamito is amazing because it's going, in my opinion, it's going to change the way that women preserve their fertility, right? It's going to make it so much more accessible less shots, less hormones. So I think that is super exciting on the horizon. I'm also excited about a lot of the AI innovations Mm -hmm. in the IVF laboratory, right? Because that may be a game changer as well. Um, In my crystal ball, people always say like, what do you wish you could do in fertility? I wish there was a way we could analyze the quality of eggs Eggs. because that's really what's missing with egg freezing. Because if you freeze... 15 eggs at age 30, I can say to you, based on statistics, this is the number of healthy embryos you Mm. should have. But nobody can tell you how many good eggs you have. And that's, to me, really what's missing if somebody asked me to, like, rub a crystal ball. Yeah. So just to talk about my today's journey. Yeah. So I came, I came here, we had the initial consultation and what tested, so we did a blood test for me and my partner. So we did genetic carrier okay. testing. So here in the States at least, um, we recommend that couples who are trying to conceive have what we call preconception visit, right? So you're not yet pregnant, but you're trying, you're thinking, you're trying, you go to your OBGYN and he or she will do genetic carrier testing okay. to make sure that you don't overlap for any recessive conditions. So the one that most of us know is like cystic fibrosis or Tay-Sachs. So yeah. if you both carried that There's back it. in the day, you may not know until you were pregnant and then you might find out that your fetus was affected and it's a very hard decision to make for a desired pregnancy. Pregnancy. But if you found out before, you could do IVF and test your embryos and remove that abnormal gene from your lineage. Oh, wow. That's impressive. Um, and very exciting. Your book is yeah. um, going to be published this January 2026. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say too much. I've, I've read, uh-huh. you know, all the uh, comments and everything. Yeah. So are you able to share anything about it? What should we, you know? It's, um, it's it's very exciting. I say it's a labor of love that I don't know. You know, people are like, oh, women forget about childbirth. That's why they do it again. I'm like, I will not forget how hard it was to write a book. Uh, no, I had wanted to write a book for a long time because I felt that there were so many innovations, so much that I could share that it was like beyond the four walls of my office. Yeah. Um, I met another a, a woman who's my collaborating author who was amazing. Um, And together we journeyed on this project. It's called Own Your Fertility. Uh, And it's really about women taking control, right? That this is really the last bastion of feminism, whether you freeze your eggs, freeze your embryos, do nothing, but at least know what's coming down the pike for you if you don't take the the decision. I'm really excited for your book. And I'd I'd recommend all my listeners to go and check it out. Uh, Once it's down, January 2026, (laughs) watch the space. And you just mentioned... um, Freezing embryos versus versus freezing eggs. Mm-hmm. So far, I've only and uh, with Dr. Dina, we discussed that 
uh, freezing eggs. And um, what's the difference between freezing embryos and freezing eggs? So I say it's like the, if you, I'm a big sports fanatic, but the first half of egg freezing and embryo freezing exactly the same, meaning you take the same hormonal injections, you have the same blood tests and ultrasounds to check the progress of your cycle. Where it changes is after the eggs come out, they're either immediately frozen mm -hmm. or they're fertilized with the sperm source and the embryos grow in the laboratory and the embryos that make it to the advanced stage will undergo a biopsy for chromosome number. Okay. So that's where the two diverge is after the eggs come out. But the process is relatively the same no matter what you're doing. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much. This brings us to an end. I just want to thank you for your time, um, you. as well as this podcast for, you know, um, my consultation today, as people can see, uh. I did my blood test and everything. It was, I was very stressed at first and I was like, maybe I can't do the podcast right after the uh. patient consultation, but no, I'm great. And I feel more comfortable talking about it. And yeah. uh, like, it's nothing that we should, you know, it shouldn't be stigmatized. We shouldn't be ashamed of it. And it's, uh, I think for any couple who's trying to conceive, it's a, uh, it's a good, you know, we live in 21st century. We have information on our phones, everything. We're overwhelmed with information and coming to see someone like yourself. And even for like 30 minutes, you answered so many of my questions. And I'm very, very grateful oh, for that. Of course. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I think like there's good places to get data, but sometimes it's all over, over the place and it's and some not accurate sources yeah. are not so accurate yeah but yeah i'm excited for your book and yes. i'm excited to see you again for my you know fertility for um, your next step in your journey, journey. exactly yeah. thank you so much of course have thank you for day. having have a wonderful thank day thank you guys don't forget to subscribe and see you next week bye